Hello everyone, my name is Molly Hogan. I'm the regional director with the Small Business Development Center located in Springfield, Massachusetts. We are glad to have you here with us today. We have a, uh, a great webinar set up for you uh, today on Bookkeeping 101. I want to thank all of the organizations here in the Valley who have been helping us uh, promote these webinars. And uh, among them are SCORE, the Center for Women and Enterprise, Valley Community Development, Common Capital, Franklin County CDC, Massachusetts Growth Capital Corporation, and the SBDC offices at Salem State and Clark University, as well as our sponsors, which are funders, we are Small Business Administration, the State of Massachusetts Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development, UMass Eisenberg School of Management, and as always, MSBDC is accredited by America's SBDC. So thank you all for joining us today. Our presenter today will be Katisha Galishaw. She's the CEO of KG Virtual CFO. She's an accounting professional with over 16 years of experience in companies ranging from startups to Fortune 100 and nonprofits and religious organizations. She holds a, a degree in accounting from, uh, from Western England University and a Master of Arts of Spiritual Formation from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminar seminary in Hamilton. So welcome, Katisha. Thank you for having me, Samalid, and thank you so much for joining us today on this Bookkeeping 101 webinar. Thank you all for seeing the importance of bookkeeping, even though it may be a topic that um, may be a little bit intimidating for some. Hopefully, we'll take some of that intimidation from the topic and we'll just have a lively, um, hopefully a little bit of a discussion. I, I know it's kind of hard um, with the Zoom platform, but hopefully we can um, have a little bit of back and forth and you'll leave with some good sound um, accounting knowledge that you can apply uh, to your business. Yeah, so bookkeeping 101, bookkeeping basics and tips for business owners. Let's get started. All right, so Warren Buffett said, accounting is the language of business. So let's take our little temperature here. When you first think of accounting, what are your initial thoughts about accounting or bookkeeping? You know, I don't know if you want to respond in the Q&A or not, but just kind of think about that. When you approach the topic of accounting and bookkeeping, what are your initial thoughts? Are you a little apprehensive? Are you rather kind of like, I don't want to see, I don't want to know? Or are you kind of excited about the topic? Or are you a geek like me and really love the numbers? Um, really We're think getting about some reactions. Some people say taxes. Some people say yikes. <laughs> <laughs> Some people say love numbers, knowledge is power, you know? All right. I love those responses. <laughs> but I've heard it said, what, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. So if you think you can get the handle on your accounting, on your bookkeeping, then you can. But if you approach it with the mindset like, oh, I can't, I can't handle these numbers, I don't know anything about it, then you're setting yourself up to make bookkeeping harder than it actually should be. Uh, if, we're going, if we're gonna be about you know, carrying on this business, if we're gonna try to um, go about business and be a profitable endeavor, if we're gonna be in business, you have to learn the language. And we're gonna try to demystify a lot of the language that we see out there. And we're gonna try to take the sting away from the fear of dealing with numbers. And we're just gonna break it down. And hopefully you'll leave with a, a, a little better um, perspective on numbers if you had an apprehensive um, idea in the beginning. So let's get at it. Our objectives today, by the end of this webinar, the participants will be able to understand accounting, the accounting cycle, the bookkeeping cycle, and be able to systematically, number one, gather your financial records or your financial documents. Number two, record those financial transactions. And then number three, prepare financial statements. Gather those financial documents, record those financial transactions, whatever way you want to. And then number three, prepare those financial statements. 
All right, what are we here for? Business or a hobby? The number one question is, are you ready to endeavor in carrying on a business or is this just a hobby? What's the difference between a business and a hobby? Well, a business operates to make profit. People engage in a hobby for sports or recreation, not necessarily to make a profit. So you see that little, I think that's an old classic camera over to the side and we got our yarn and our knitting. So if you got a camera and you just love to take pictures and uh, you just snap pictures for fun as a hobby, that's not necessarily a business. But then if you go about it and you buy that extra equipment and you maybe deck out a studio in your house or maybe uh, rent some a studio to take pictures, now, and then you start charging people for those pictures and selling your product. Now you may be getting into the realm of conducting a business. And the IRS has set aside nine factors that it looks at when considering whether an activity is a hobby or a business. And guess what the number one, the first factor that it looks at when it's trying to determine if this activity is actually a, a business, a profit generating business or a hobby. The first thing it looks at is whether, of course, the endeavor, the activity is carried on in a business-like manner. And that includes, number one, whether you have complete and accurate books and records. All right, so when you decide that I'm going to start a business, first thing that's in your mind that has to go into that consideration is, what am I going to do about bookkeeping? I have to make sure that I have clear and concise books and records for this business. Because the major tax difference between a business and a hobby is that if I have a hobby, I'm just taking pictures, having fun, and I'm and my costs or my expenses are greater than the income that I receive and I have a loss as a result of that hobby, I can't deduct that loss on my tax return because it's just a personal hobby. But if I go the step further and I establish this as now a business, maybe I get my business certificate down at City Hall or at the town, or maybe I go on and establish later on down the road an LLC or something like that, if I generate a loss where, like, if you're, you're in good company, if you generate a loss in the first couple of years, the first few years of this activity, if I generate a loss and it's a business, then I can deduct that on my tax return. If I have earned income for whatever resource or whatever source that I may have, if I have a loss of the business, I can offset that loss, that negative income against the income that I have. But if I have a hobby, then the IRS is not going to let me take that loss. But if you have income, whether it's a hobby or a business, you're supposed to report it. All right, so the first step, remember I said, the first step of this accounting, this bookkeeping cycle is to gather those financial documents. Maybe I should pause and see if there was any questions about the bookkeep, the hobby versus business. If there's anything, you can chime in, Somali. But number one, gather those financial documents. First thing we're going to do is gather those financial documents and we're going to define those. This a new, it's a new age term and it's kind of new in the accounting world to call world to call that step of gathering those financial documents we call it pre-accounting. Let's define that. Pre-accounting is the system through which financial data and we'll define financial data. So we have to develop a system through which financial data is gathered it's coded, it's aggregated, and normalized so that you can actually get to the accounting. So we're not even there at the accounting stage. You see that picture where it's stacked with folders and, and multiple colors and all these papers all over the place? We're going to gather, we're going to develop a system by which all those documents are uh, number one, gathered. Number two, coded. So we're going to make sure that they're categorized. Every piece of paper, every financial document that relates to my business, I got to define it. I got to say, what is this? Is this, an is this an invoice? Then this is an income document. Is this a receipt? Then it's an expense document. So I'm going to develop this system that whenever I have financial data, I am going to gather it. I'm going to code it or categorize it. I'm going to total it up. And then I'm going to create a system where I can start it all over again. So once you got a 
it's going to take some time in the beginning to develop a system, but once you have a system where you gathered it, code it, and aggregate it, whenever you get a new piece of financial data that's related to your business, it can go right through that system of being gathered, coded, and aggregated. It starts all over again. Now that system, it may be paper or it may be digital, but you should have a system and that's pre-accounting. All right, let's talk about those financial documents. And number one, we're gonna determine the final fin filing system. So if you wanna have your papers, you wanna keep a paper file, you wanna keep, you know, I have business owners that maybe have a folder and they have a color coded folder and they put all their receipts in one, they may categorize it by month or they may categorize it by expense type, but they have a system <laughs> through which all those financial records uh, are coded, are categorized, are tallied together. Now, I, my history is from uh, is an auditor for the Internal Revenue Service. And when I first started off auditing small businesses, guess what I would get for a filing system? I'd get a shoebox full of receipts. And they would tell me, here's all the records, all my business records. You look at them and, and tell me whether it's right. That's not the way to go. You have to be able, if you have a shoebox, make sure you maybe rubber band some receipts together, some type of way to categorize all the financial records that come in. If it's electronic, maybe you have folders on your desktop, maybe you have a Google Drive that is categorized by month or categorized by vendor, whatever system that you have, it has to work for you. I can't give you the system, but whatever makes sense for you, make sure it's an organized system that you can gather the documents, code them, and aggregate them. Some, some major financial documents, of course, are the bank statements. And this is a place where I should pause for a ca caveat. This is no longer a hobby. This is a business. So I would suggest, strongly advise, that you have a separate business bank account. Please don't intermingle your personal funds with your business funds. If you can, please go to the bank, open up a separate bank account so that all your business income, all your business expenses are coming from that business bank account. Number two, maybe you have credit cards that are in the business's name. That's a major financial document that has to be part of this pre-accounting system. If um, this year, maybe you were able um, to take advantage of the SBA loans or the PPP loans, and now you have loan statements, or even before then, maybe you had taken out a business loan and you have loan statements. That's part of your pre-accounting financial records, and you should have a system by which you can go and easily put your hands on those documents. Along the lines, your business may have purchased some assets. Maybe you purchased that camera to a new camera or a new lens, or don't, don't get me to try to um, figure out all the different equipment that goes along with the photography business, but some lighting or whatever, backdrops. All right, uh, all of that good stuff. When you purchase those assets, make sure you have a system by which you can gather those together. Purchase influence, maybe your business, um, has a brick and mortar location. Make sure those real estate closing documents are all in the same or a place where you can easily put your hands on. Maybe during this um, pandemic, you have started an office uh, in your home and you realize that um, that metal folding chair is not very comfortable. So you purchased a nice ergonomic chair. That's a bit, and if it's used for your business, that's a business asset. Make sure you have a place where you have all those documents together. Now, how long should you keep these documents? I don't want you to be a hoarder and hold on to them forever in a day. The general rec um, the general advice from the Internal Revenue Service is that you keep those records three years from the date that you file your return. So we're in 2020, you're gonna get ready to file your 2020 tax return in April, 2021. Three years from that time, you have to keep those, generally keep those financial statements, those financial documents. So you'll be keeping those for the 2020 tax year, you'll be keeping those documents for until 2024. 
And that's a general rule of thumb. Talk to your accountant if they need you to hold on to things a little bit longer. Maybe it's an asset that you purchased and your accountant wants to depreciate that over a longer period of time. He may need you to hold on or she may need you to hold on to those documents for a longer period of time. Employment tax records, if you have an employee, um, you have to keep those a year longer, so four years. All right, other finding, we talk about the major financial documents, the bank statement, credit card statements, loan documents. What about those other financial documents? Let's drill a little bit deeper. On the income side of things, you're selling your product, you're selling your service, and you invoice your customer. You need a place where you can keep those invoices. Sales receipts. If you're pretty old school, you want to write out those, those paper sales receipts, um, you have to keep those documents. Deposit slips, when you go to your business bank account and make those deposits of cash and check, make sure you hold on to those deposit slips. If you have a point of sale service, maybe you have a restaurant or a convenience store and you have a point of sale service uh, that you use to record all the transactions and those, sir, uh, those the point of sale systems generates reports you wanna hang on to those reports. Those are part of your financial documents that has to be part of your system of gathering, coding, and totaling. If you use PayPal, you use Square, they offer an easy way for you to find those documents, download them, and save. Now, I don't suggest generally that you use Venmo or Cash App for business purposes, but if you do, make sure that you can go in First of all, make sure you have a separate cash app for business than personal, separate Venmo for business rather than personal. And then make sure you can go in there and download and extract those business income reports. Hopefully this is clear. And all right, so another way that you can track business income is say you're a freelancer and someone that you worked for paid you a total of $600 within the year. It doesn't have to be all at one time. It just may be over the year, they paid you a total of $600. They're going to, at the end of the year, give you a form 1099. Um, 1099 MISC, and then starting in 2020 is going to be 1099 NEC for non-employee compensation. Those are part of your financial documents. Hold on to those. Give those to your accountant at the end of the year. Use those to reconcile in your accounting um, software, whether your gross receipts is kind of close or near the, that 1099 form 1099 because the IRS has a, a mechanism to match those 1099s to your tax return. And if they see missing income, you're gonna get a letter. <clears throat> That's the income side. What about the expense side? Keep those receipts, keep those PayPal reports, keep those cash app reports. If you have bills for utilities, the vendor accounts, maybe you have a vendor account with Staples or Quill or Uline or, you or Amazon, you have a vendor account and you have these bills, hold on to them. Make sure they're part of your pre-accounting system. And then those of us, and I include myself, that still write checks, Hold on to those canceled checks. They're part of your business financial documents. Also keep track of, namely, I've, some of you may be just um, opening your business bank account or just separating the business from the personal. Keep track of the money that you personally have invested in the business. Maybe you personally from your own funds have purchased equipment or purchased uh, supplies for your business. Make sure you keep track of those. Make sure you include it in your pre-accounting um, system. All right, here we go. What to deduct? Hey, Yes. Hi. Uh, before we move on to the next section, real quick, we have two questions uh, in regards to the credit card. Does it have to be in the name of the business or could it be a separate credit card designated just for business? So uh, generally, um, you would want to, if you can, get um, a credit card in the business name to establish a segregation from personal to business. But if you have a separate credit card uh, that's different from the one that you use for personal purposes, as long as you have a way to document and track uh, that these are specifically business related expenses, that should be fine. All right. And then uh, why do you recommend Venmo or Cash App in your income or sales? 
I don't. <laughs> I don't, but I know <laughs> some people do use those. I do not recommend those because, ge because generally it's harder to obtain those reports. And it's hard, um, not unless you have it, the cash app specifically designated for the business and it's connected specifically to your business account. That's cool. But those type of apps, they're usually used better for personal um, transactions, not usually business transactions. But if you use it, please have a good um, system in place to designate what's business income and not. Right. Excellent. And then we have one more question here in the chat. What if you make purchases for your business, but they're in a year prior to officially launching? Can you still deduct yeah. those expenses? Okay, so yeah, talk to your accountant because every expense that you have paid for, every investment that you've made up until the time that you officially launch as a business, those are called startup expenses. And your accountant may want, there may be special tax treatment for those uh, startup expenses. So definitely put them in a place, make sure they're tallied and totaled and give those to their accountant just in case there's special tax treatment for those amounts. Good to go, good to go. Okay, what can you deduct? Cost of goods sold is a, these are all expenses, but cost of goods sold is a special type of expense because these are the expenses that are directly related to your sale of whatever goods or services that you offer. So those would be the cost of materials, those would be the cost of direct labor, um, any storage costs that are directly related to the sale of your business. Now this can get a little tricky. So for example, if you own or operate a convenience store and you have on your shelf lots of candy and, and soft drinks and drinks, waters, and all that other good stuff that are in your convenience store, your cost of goods sold is the actual wholesale price of those auto items. Those are, those are called co the cost of goods sold or COGS or cost of sale. There's various names, but any, any expense that's directly related to the sale of your product, um, those are called cost of goods sold. For me, I'm a service-based company, so I'm not selling a product. But my cost of sales would be the direct salaries that I pay for my bookkeepers, those that um, I have on staff, my CPA that I have on staff that prepares tax returns. That's part of my cost of good goods sold. For um, so yes, yeah, so for any any when you're selling, maybe you're creating bracelets and so everything you um, purchase that's part of the bracelet every type of bead and every type of uh, you know see I'm, I'm a left brain person so like the creative side struggles but every part of that product that's or maybe you're making a mask <laughs> one of those safe masks that face mask that we make so every material that goes into creating those masks that's a cost of goods sold everything that's directly related we're looking at a calculator there on the screen so all of the cost of those little bu buttons that's cost of goods sold the cost of that screen Green, the mic, the chip that's inside of that calculator, that's a cost that's directly related to the sale of that, cu that calculator. There are other expenses that are deductible. These are other expenses, salaries and wages, contractors, rent expense, interest expense, any type of taxes that you may pay uh, related to the business, insurance costs for the business. These are all the other types of deductible expenses. If you use your car for business purposes, say you go and when we used to travel and see each other face to face, um, you use your car to go out to a business appointment and meet a client track those business miles generate a log that has the date of that appointment the 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 description what are you who are you meeting why are you meeting them and the number of miles that you drove in your car give that to your accountant they're going to total up all the miles for that year and the standard mileage rate for 2020 is 57 and a half cents 
total. So say throughout the year, you um, drove your car 10,000 10, miles. You drove to a business expo to uh, display your product. That's part of business miles. You drove to meet a client for lunch. That's part of your business mile. You drove to a factory to check it out to see if you should rent that. That's business miles. But you also use the car for personal reasons. So you can't use the total miles that you drove your car as a business uh, deduction, but you take just those business miles, total those up and you get a deduction for that. Also, if you have a specific area in your home that you use for business purposes, it's designated specifically for business purposes, talk to your accountant, you may be able to get a deduction for the business use of the home. Now beware, there are implications, tax, impl tax implications once you sell your home. Um, so make sure you beware and talk to your accountant and uh, see if that would be beneficial for you. I'm sure there's gonna be questions um, about that, but that's the end of that section. So if we have questions, let's- Yes, we have in. questions here. Um, one of them, which I started to answer, because I think I know the answer, but I'll confirm with you. Um, <laughs> since you work with the IRS, you definitely know this one. Um, can you use gas instead of miles for deductions? And my initial answer to that was, one or the other, like mileage or gas and maintenance expenses. You can't combine both. Is that correct? Your head on. Maybe you should have a job with the IRS. <laughs> There's two <laughs> separate ways of recording those car expenses. Either you total up the mileage and you take that deduction, or you total up the gas, the tolls, the easy pass, um, any repairs for your car, um, anything that's related to directly related to your car expenses, and you get a percentage of those expenses based on the mileage that you drove for business, you get either or, whatever's larger, either the mileage or you get the actual expenses, either or. But so you still need to talk. Go ahead. Yeah, so say for example, I'm putting on my gas in my credit card, which I only use for business expenses. Then I put my oil change in there. Then my car needed new tires and it needed new brakes and all that. So at the end of the year, I'll add up all of my car expenses and say, I figured out I drove my car 20,000 miles, but only 10,000 of those miles were, I mean, that 20,000 is a lot of miles, but. <laughs> this is an example, but it's 50%, 50% of the time I use my car for expenses. So I add all those expenses up and I divide them by two and I only did that. So I only did that half 50%. That or whatever's larger between 10,000 times 57 and a half percent. 57 and a half cents. Correct. Correct. So, so yeah, you, you have to make that judgment. You can't do both. So you have to choose either you do the mileage of 57 and a half cents or you add up all your expenses for the year and you figure out what the percentage you use the car for and you do, you do that, you know. So exactly. and um, it's OK if you use your business debit card for gas. Um, it, it's fine. The pop, the time, the the. You could even have two business credit cards. The point is, is that you you track it separately from your from your personal, so that it's easier to track. Um, Absolutely. And then and then we had another question here about cost of goods sold. Um, it's um, and I and I lost it. I think I um, I accidentally hold on. Maybe somebody, if I go back, something about cost of goods sold on a credit card. I don't know if some if whoever answered the question could do it again. That'd be great. <laughs> Because I lost it. Okay, so what is the difference between contractors and direct labor costs? So they could be similar. So if you pay a contractor for direct, so say, um, the so say if I contract someone out to to handle um, marketing, and the marketing is directly related to what I do in business. So maybe I'm a marketing agency and I contract someone out to do a part of that marketing. That would make it cost a uh, direct labor. But if I, for me, a bookkeeping business, I hire someone for marketing because that is not my cup of tea. He's just, the, my, marketer is, my marketer is just a contractor for me. And if I pay that person over $600 in a year, I'm giving them a 1099. Right. Hope that okay. makes it. 
Great. No, that that's great. That that makes sense. And um, I think I, I figured out the question about the credit card. So credit card expense, um, I think meaning merchant fees, are those considered cost of goods sold? Very, very good. Very, very good. Yes, yes. So um, the merchant fees that you pay for Stripe, Square, PayPal, all of that good stuff, that's part of cost of goods sold or that it's part of a net sales figure, whatever it is. I usually use it as cost of goods sold because that's part of me offering my services. I have to pay those merchants in order to accept credit or debit cards. So yes, that's cost of goods sold. Excellent. And how are Wi-Fi costs and costs to set up and maintain a website factored into the cost of goods sold? So it may not be if um, Wi-Fi is not part of your business, the business that you do. It may be just a, a direct other expense. The Wi-Fi and website may be part of your advertising expense or utilities expense if it's just a monthly Wi-Fi fee. It may not be related to cost of goods sold. Right. And, and one of the things that I, when you do your taxes or you have your account to do your tax, there's certain categories that are included in there. And I, it's been a while. It's been since I did my taxes, so I can't remember which one is the category, but, you know, I consider those business expenses, you know, they go into some of those other categories, expenses that are related to me running my business, advertising expense, for example, I will consider a website, you know, advertising expense. Um, mm -hmm. And if I'm doing Wi-Fi for just for the business, not the one that I have in my house, you know, but the one that for my business, maybe I have a hotspot or something for my business, I will put that on the other type of expense, business expense, not necessarily cost sure. of goods sold. Sure, sure. All right. Exactly. So, so someone here, here's asked, yeah, would love to better understand home office expense issue when you sell your home. Okay, so they may want to email me specifically on that. Um, it may be a little bit out of the scope of it, but generally, if I, so normally my home, um, I don't take a business deduction for my home because it's my personal residence. But now if I designate a portion of my home for business, it converts that portion of my home into a business asset. So say if I decked out my basement to be my office and I use that exclusively for business, 20% of my home is now not my personal residence. 20% of my home is a business asset. So then when I sell my home, the 20% of the sales price is going to be related to the sale of a business asset. Uh, that's kind of high level overview. And there may be some tax, like a capital gains tax that's related to that. But I'd be happy if they email me, I'll be happy to discuss that a little bit further. Right. But in general, though, if you just have a, a, a home office in your home, like where you put your computer, your, you know, your fax, your stuff, but you're not actually like having clients come to your home and, you know, it's not running as a business, right? It's not something you really have to worry about, but it, it you don't have to do it. You can choose or cho the business use of a home is a choice. You don't have to deduct that for a business purpose at all. Talk to your accountant and see if that makes sense for you. Right. Um, um, and then just to confirm for those of us who, um, you know, so here someone says, if I can't get a business checking account for a startup DBA, is it okay to have a separate personal account that, you know, separate personal account for use for business? But I, I would, I would almost push back on that. I mean, why can't you get a business checking account? You know, you should be able to write with a, with a, uh, what do you need? A, a business certificate, right? You need to um, go and register your business at city hall, town hall. Um, and use that business certificate to take it to the bank and then you can create your DBA. But, um, so what, what do you think about that, Katisha? I mean, uh, I mean, what people would, what would be a situation where someone can't get a business checking account? I mean, I think you would probably let me know better than, um, than I could say, but generally, like you said, if you, well, all right. So I recently had a client that, um, is running into an issue getting a business certificate or a DBA. She lives in a local town and she lives in a condo and her condo association 
may not allow her to use that as a quote unquote business address. Right. So she may not be able to get a DBA. So that may be an instance where, you know, you may not get a business certificate, which would preclude you from getting a business bank account. Yeah. Especially, I think some of the folks that are doing like online businesses, they're not seeing clients. They're not, um, really handling um, business transactions at home. They're kind of just fulfilling things or whatnot. Um, having a, pers uh, a personal checking account to track your business financial separate may be okay. Um, but yeah. I- As long as you keep it separate, I mean, I think, yeah, keeping it separate from your personal fun funds is completely ideal. I mean, I'd prefer, you'd prefer, it'd be preferred to have a business account, but if you can't, as long as you have a separate a way to track the business income separately, then that's fine. Right. And just to confirm, um, things that you spend in your business, including any trainings that you go to, that you pay for, all of those things, keep track of them, keep the receipts. Those are tax deductibles. Those go on your on your um, tax returns as, as, the, as deductions, you know, in one of those expense categories. For sure, for sure. Any type of webinar that you may have to pay costs for, any type of educational development or coaching that you may um, participate in to develop your skills in the business, the line of business that you're in, those are deductible business expenses. And what do you have? You have um, more than one car. Can you deduct, <laughs> you know, mileage in different cars? I think, I think if it's just mileage that you're deducting, does it really matter which car you're using? It doesn't it, matter. Yeah, right. So if you have two or three cars and you take turns between all the cars, you know, you drive the fun convertible for those fancy appointments and maybe you drive the four by four to the more, you know, winter appointments, that's fine. Keep track of your expenses, keep track of your, of your mileage and you can do that. But if you do just expenses, gas and maintenance, then you kind of have to track it for each car, correct? Sure. Yeah. Anytime like that goes into your log. So in your log, you should uh, denote against the day, the mileage or the expense. And it might be worthwhile to note if you have multiple cars, this was for the Jeep, this was for the car, uh, just for your own way to check in your mind at the end of the year and see if it makes sense, the total mileage or the total expenses for each car. Right, right. And uh, there's a question here on the chat. Would you have to 1099 a landlord? I'm not actually sure. Did you mention something about landlords? Uh, so, no, so landlord is not a contractor that you would pay for your business. Um, uh, so if it's a commercial property and you pay your, your, the commercial landlord rent, um, that's a rent expense, but you still won't have to issue them a 1099. No, I don't see the reason to issue a 1099 for that. No, you kind of, you, you, you have a lease that states what your rent is and you can keep track of your payments to your landlord. You typically, you know, make a check, you know, for example, or if you're paying cash, then you want a receipt or you want to show that you paid uh, cash. Um, but I don't, I, I don't recommend that. <laughs> Check. Well, you don't have to do the 1099. Yeah, but you don't have to do the 1099. Just to answer the question. Um, okay, let's say if a business use a uh, credit card for purchase, how will I calculate the interest on the debt if I keep balance for another month? I keep the balance. If, if a business use... So if this is your business credit card and you use the, all the purchases on that business credit card is specifically um for your business then the interest for that card is deductible yeah okay emil does that answer your question it, yes uh, so if i use the business card the business credit card uh and i carry the, the the balance month to month so this interest will be count as a expense or it is it is an interest expense that's related to your business. Yep, as long as all the purchases on that business card are for business purpose purposes, it's an interest expense that's deductible for your okay. uh, tax return. Okay, great. So, so we can go move on, and we'll come back to some more of these questions. I think maybe this should have been a whole uh, webinar. This one section, right? I don't know if we're going to have a chance to get through. I want to be mindful of the hour timeline that we had. Um, maybe we should. We have, have an hour. I think. We're going to okay. 30, right? 
Okay. All right. You're all right. Done. So I had, all right. All right. So I'll try to move it along. But good, great questions. I'm glad that uh, there's a lot of interaction there. So the first part of it, the first part of our bookkeeping accounting cycle was to gather the financial documents. The second step is now to record those financial transactions. And now we're talking about accounting. Accounting is the theory and system of set that you set up to maintain the books of the business. All those financial documents, now you're going to tell your accounting system what they are for. And that's part of this step. So let's get into the little mumbo jumbo here. We're going to talk a little accounting jargon. Please um, forgive me, uh, but we're going to use some terms here, accounting terms. Hopefully you can still hang with me. Um, basic accounting terminology, assets. Assets are anything of value that your business owns. These represent the sources uh, that, you're, that are the resources that are owned by the business. And you may have a bank account with cash in it. Cash is an asset. You may have um, a, a, biz, a business account that you invest with or you have a CD. That's an asset. An asset also is um, any equipment that you have. Those are assets. And if you, an asset that the useful life of it that extends beyond the year, those are called long-term assets. So if I buy a computer, generally that computer is gonna last me for more than a year. So that's gonna be a long-term asset. When I show that to my accountant, how much I spent for it, he or she may want to depreciate the cost of that long-term asset. It's again, it's something that the business owns, but the life of it extends beyond a year. So any type of equipment that I have, um, that vehicle, that's a business vehicle, my accountant, you give that information to your accountant, that's an asset, but it's a long-term asset, and that may be uh, depreciable over a number of years. So your inventory is an asset. So you're selling uh, prop products, you're selling those bracelets, you're selling, um, reselling cell phones, you, you're reselling those, ma you those face masks. That's what you have on hand. Those are assets of the business. So think about your business and what particular assets are relevant to your type of business. Again, if you have a customer and you give the, sell them the good or you offer that service, and they don't pay you right away, you allow them to pay within maybe seven days or 30 days or beyond. That's called accounts receivable. That's an asset. So it's something on the books. I've already offered my services. I've already sold you my product, but you haven't paid me, paid me yet. That's an asset that I own. It's an accounts receivable. That money is due to me. That's an asset. On the other end, liabilities are those, those items, those debts that you as a business owe to your creditors. Those are liabilities. Those are those loans that you may have taken out, that's a liability. That credit card that you have, that's a liability. If you have an account with a vendor, you have an account with Amazon, you have an account with Staples, you have an account with a, 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 a vendor that you purchase your products from or p materials from, that, that's a liability. And you don't have to pay them right away, you pay them in the future, that's a liability that your business owns. And then the difference between your assets and your liability, that's called equity. This equity represents uh, the, owner's, um, uh, the owner's value that they have in a company. We have our assets, everything that I own, and then I subtract out from that everything that I owe, and what's left is the value that I have in my business. That's what it may be comprised of what I personally have put into the business as owner investment. And it's a, uh, or it may be what I may have taken out from the business. That's part of the equity. Hopefully that's, I'm trying to keep it high level. Um, but for a small business, um, you may not have many assets. You may not have many liabilities, but the difference between those is your equity. 
going further now, so these three items, assets, liabilities, and equity, these three items all go on what is called the balance sheet. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but all these items go on the balance sheet. And it's the same. This is what I love about accounting, because it's equal opportunity. If I pick up a balance sheet from Walmart and I pick up a balance sheet from uh, uh, the convenience store down the street, they all have assets, liabilities, and equity. They may have various levels of those things, but they all have assets, liabilities, and equity. It's the same across the board. So once you get that terminology down, then you'll know how to properly record these items in your accounting system. And that means everything when we come to the next step, which is generating those reports. These three items, asset, liabilities, and equity goes on your balance sheet. These two items, revenue and expense, they go on your income statement, or another way to um, call that is the profit and loss, or P&L, revenue. Revenue, again, is the money that's coming in. That's the inflow of money. That's my sales. Even if I'm a nonprofit, that's my donations. That's my grants that come in. Anything that the company receives when they um, sell products that they have manufactured or they sell services that they have offered, that's called revenue. That's called income. That's called sales. You subtract from those things all the outflows from your business. Again, we've already talked about that, but the salaries, the utilities, the rents, the insurance, the office supplies, those are all the expenses. And the revenue minus the expenses, if that's a positive number, then that's net income. And if that's a negative number, that's a net loss. Revenue is inflows. Expenses are outflows of money. So when you're talking about picking an accounting software, you have to determine what are your needs. You may not need the same type of sophisticated accounting software as someone else that has inventory or that has other complicated transactions um, has. You may, I mean, here are some, some general um, choices for accounting software. You can use an Excel template. Um, these are links. So if you get a copy of this presentation and you click these links, they'll take you directly to the um, website where you can see these different accountant softwares. But the Excel template that connects you to, I believe, an SBA or a SCORE template. But you you search, you can do a Google search for a, a profit and loss template or a balance sheet template. Fine. If you don't need an accounting software, start with Excel and plug in the income and the expense, and it, it could work just fine. But when you're determining what software to use or what to use for your business in this um, accounting step of the accounting cycle, you have to determine what platform would you use. Do you need to track inventory? Do you need something that would capture your receipts. So there's various, most of these um, cloud-based accounting softwares, you can take a picture of your receipt and connect it, upload it directly to QuickBooks or FreshBooks or Wave or Xero. You, so you don't have to even keep the paper version of it. You could take a picture of it, upload it to the software, and there you have it. You have an electronic version of the receipts because we know with those, especially certain type of receipts on that special paper, those tend to fade. So it's good to have a backup. So if you could take a photo of it and associate it with some type of online backup system and then back that up, I'm a big fan of backing up. I have two and three backs up, backups of my, my data. So uh, if you take a picture of it and upload it into your Google Drive or upload it into QuickBooks or one of these accounting softwares, then you have a backup of those receipts. Do I need to track sales tax? All of those types of needs would determine the level and the type of accounting software that you use. QuickBooks Online, of course, is uh, the most, one of the most famous ones. Um, and I see Samala coming back on. You let me know if I have any questions. Um, FreshBooks is another one that starts at $15 a month. Wave is completely free. I love that software. I've been um, advising that to a lot of companies that are just starting off. It offers a lot of the functionalities of the cloud-based accounting softwares, um, but it's, it's absolutely free. Zero is another one that starts at nine. And all of these would connect directly to your 
business bank account. So you would need your credentials. You would need your username and your password and you connect it directly to one of these software platforms and all your financial transactions are downloaded and you categorize them from there. Are there any questions? Yes, yes, we have a few questions here. Someone asked here, um, is there an accounting software specifically for medical practice? I don't know of one offhand. And I'm thinking it's almost like, um, um, you know, when you're looking at medical practices and those kind of practices, you have the separate functions. You almost have to separate the billing from the accounting and, and they connect, they, they'll connect. Uh, and if you can connect your accounting software with your billing, it's perfect. Um, but, um, but there's some very specific ways that you need to submit your invoice your, for, for. Like the ERM type system where you do all your billing from, that's going to be separate usually from your accounting software. Okay. Okay. But so it's separate. It's completely separate. You can't connect them. Well, sometimes look, so if you have something like QuickBooks, they have, uh, connections with various what they call apps so you can search in their app store and see if you can connect those two types of software sometimes there is a connection sometimes there's there's not right right and um there is a comment here she's um uh, Lori says, I've been working with Katisha for a few months. She recommended Wave. It is easy, free. So this is a little commercial for you, Katisha. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, for that, for that comment. And um, uh, Lori asks, is it true that you can deduct only the, well, so going back to the deductions real quick, as we missed this question earlier, can you deduct only the mortgage interest and not the entire mortgage if you're using part of your home as a business? That's uh, well, so those are two separate things. So the interest you take a percentage. So say if I'm using 20% of my home for business, then I would deduct 20% of that interest as a business expense. Now there is an option to depreciate. Um, so the purchase price of purchase price of your home. If you, again, if I use 20% of my home for business, I would take 20% of the purchase price of my home. So I paid $100,000 for my home. 20% of that is for my business. So I would depreciate $20,000 of that over almost 30 years. Your, your accountant will tell you it's 27 and a half years or 39 years, you would depreciate that. So those are two separate things. The interest is one thing and depreciation is another, but they both can be business uh, deductions based on the percentage of use for your home. Right, okay, all right. You, I, looks like you may continue. Cool beans, cool beans. All right, so let's take a quick look. I think we have some time. Let's look at the QuickBooks Online subscription plans. If you wanted to choose and see your options, just this kind of gives you a layout of the levels of service and the different pricing options that they have. So QuickBooks always offer, has sales. It's usually 50% off, but now they're having a Labor Day sale. It's 70% off for three months. But what I really wanted to get to is these levels of service. So <clears throat> the simple stuff, Start. Say if I just need to use the accounting software to track income and expenses, I just need to tr capture my receipts and have a place to upload them. I just need a way to maybe accept some payments. QuickBooks has a merchant account where you can invoice someone and they can pay the invoice and they take a merchant fee and things like that. Or I want to track my business miles. If I even want to issue 1099s. Simple start may be the way to go. I, again, it depends on your needs. But then if you go over and you need maybe to track inventory or maybe you need to track time or maybe you need more users or you want to pay bills through QuickBooks, then you have to start upgrading your service. So again, assess your needs and choose the plan or the software that makes the most sense for you, knowing that if you need to upgrade a service in the future that you can, you may want to start small and upgrade it from then. Or if you don't need all the service that you have, you may downgrade it. Any questions? Uh, no, no. Continue. Okay. Cool. All right. So let me see if I can 
Oh, all right. This is a real test. Um, While well, you're switching track. screen, just going to show us a quick demo of QuickBooks. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I, I did want to share a quick story um, about um, a few of the folks that we work with, um, landscapers in particular, uh, that figure out how to use QuickBooks very efficiently. Um, and they send, they automate their invoices to the clients, right? Because they're on a monthly payments. They'll say, you know, I'll do your lawn for $40 a cut. And they figure out they go there every week. So they, they just automate, they send out those invoices every month. And folks are paying with their, um, with like an electronic check. So they don't have to use, um, they don't have to pay merchant fees per se. They're paying their QuickBooks um, subscription, whatever that may be. Um, but they don't have to pay an extra uh, fee for credit card fees because their clients are paying with it, with a checking account with a debit account. So it's it's really it, it's one of those ways that you can use to kind of help yourself a little bit because two or three percent per credit card transaction can add up, and that's money out of your pocket. You know you do get a you can deduct it, but you know you would you rather deduct it or have the cash in your pocket, you know? So there's ways to encourage your customers to use their debit card or their checking rather than always use credit card and they can still do it online. That's really cool. So they invoice the customer, but the customer pays by check. And so they yeah, get- I get an quarter. email. So that's, I'm, I'm the customer. I get an email, say, hey, Somali, do you owe XYZ for the month of August? I go in and I put in my routing number, my checking account, my name, and I pay the bill. And then I get a receipt and it's, it's simple. And he doesn't have to pay any merchant fees. Nice, nice, very nice. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, there's a question here. Tell me about job cost on QuickBooks. There's a question in the chat. It comes from, uh, from, from uh, let's see, on QuickBooks Pro. Job cost on QuickBooks Pro. Do you know what he's referring to? Job cost on QuickBooks. Frank, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you so you can ask your question because we're not really sure where you're referring to hold on let me find you my list here yeah, frank here you go frank go ahead and ask your question go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question you still muted frank sorry i think it was my fault i may have accidentally muted you again are we good you're good now we can hear okay. you so my question is about job costs on project work, okay? We like to have a job costs, you know, beginning, during, and after. Um, and QuickBooks Pro is kind of uh, not real easy to do that, so to speak. I was wondering if you might offer some suggestions on that. So if you have the plus level of the subscription, they do offer a function called projects. And right. within a project you can track your costs in 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 that section okay so if i if you can see my screen now this is a quickbooks yeah. plus subscription over here in projects is where you would you can actually ha house all the data that's related to a relative project so if you want to um track all your invoices here if you want to track all your expenses that are related to that specific job you can do it within this projects function but this is only available for the plus level or a greater okay so i have online uh quickbooks pro so i'll have to see if that, that must be a step up i guess pro i'm not sure i'm not i'm not familiar with the pro now you have quickbooks online or do you have desktop uh we have the online the online. All right. So these are the levels that they have. They have simple start plus advanced. I'm sorry. I have I have desktop. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. okay. So that so desktop is different um, from QuickBooks Online, right. and I believe the project functionality. Um, I'm not sure if that's available in the desktop version. Okay. You would have to do a little bit of research on that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. 
So this is a sample company. If you ever wanted to kind of play around with QuickBooks, all you have to do is Google QuickBooks sample company, and they will bring you to this test drive um, business. It's called Greg's Design and Landscaping. It's always there. It's always the same. And you can play along with QuickBooks a little bit and get your feel for it before you decide to choose it. And so for Craig's design and landscaping, he has, these are his business accounts. He has a business checking account. He has a business savings account, and he also has a business MasterCard. So he has two bank accounts and a, and a credit card. The visa looks like there's zero data there. So I'm not sure if that's a functional account, but so this is what happened. So we're talking about the accounting section or the recording transaction section of the accounting cycle. This is where the rubber meets the road. And this is why I talked a little bit about the accounting terminology and all of that good stuff, because this is where you're actually going to connect it to your business bank account, connect it to your business savings or business credit card, and you're going to categorize these transactions. You're going to code them. You're going to tell QuickBooks what these transactions are. And the way that you categorize them is vitally important because let's say, for example, so this, uh, so, so this is his bank feed for Craig's Design checking account and transaction on, oh, that's, Oct that's in the future. That, that threw me off. October 9th. I'm like, what? All right. Anyway, so um, October 9th, he, he's going to receive $55. So you got to tell quick, right now, QuickBooks don't, doesn't know what to do with that right now. So you have to click on that transaction similar to what you would do with a wave or a zero or any fresh books you would have to go in and tell them based on your accounting knowledge go back and determine whether it's an asset liability equity income expenses you have to tell it what to do this money that came in 55 dollars i'm we're going to say this is income of some sort but what type of income is it craig has already designated certain types of income that are relevant to his business which is a design and landscaping um, company so this 55 dollars that came in let's say it's related to landscaping services you see the the name of the account is landscaping service but the type is income so this is not going to be an expense. This is not going to be equity or assets. This is income. I'm going to tell QuickBooks this $55 that we received or going to receive is going to be income. I tell it that it's going to be landscaping services, which is an income account. And I add it. It's going to be similar. It may look a little different in the other platforms, but the, the theory of it is exactly the same. Um, that those are monies coming in. These are monies that are going out. I have to tell QuickBooks $1,200. What did I spend that on? Um, let's find an expense. Uh, this is for A1 rental. Let's say this was equipment rental. It's an expense, but the specific type of expense is equipment rental. So I categorize, categorize it as that and I add it. Why I say this is so important is because the business, the, the business bank account you deposit various things in it. You may be depositing owners invest something that you personally, your personal money that you're investing into the business. You don't want to categorize that as income because at the end of the year, when you give your accountant a profit and loss or an income statement that has that income in it, you're overstating your income because it wasn't actually income. It was an investment. So say right here, this 200 dollars. I don't want to say that this is income. Maybe this is um, equity. So equity is, let's see if I can find it on his chart of accounts. He may not have it, but I want to tell it that this is not <clears throat> equity. So this is, uh, I would, it, he needs a owner's investment. But say this, instead of open, opening balance equity, say this was owner's investment. I want to tell that this is not income that's going in my bank account. This is equity. So I have to tell QuickBooks that it's equity. So because at the end of the year, I don't want to overstate my income. Say if you receive those PPP funds. So say if this 800, 
dollars was um, was a, a loan that you received. Hopefully you got a little bit more than that, but say it was a loan that you received. You don't want to categorize that as income because you're going to overstate your income and you're going to pay more in taxes than you actually have to. You have to put on your accounting hat and you got to say, wait a minute, I'm going to tell this, I'm going to tell QuickBooks, I'm going to tell my accounting software, this is not income, but this is actually a loan. So this is where, this is why we went through all that accounting mumble jumbo because in this section, we're going to actually tell and classify all of our business transactions and tell it exactly what um, these transactions are for. So this is something that you would see in QuickBooks. That was his checking account. This is his savings account. He has one transaction that he received. It may be a transfer. Now, if I'm transferring money from one account to another, I don't want to report that as income. I want to report that as a transfer. So you, this classification, this categorization section or this um, process of, of accounting, this is vitally important because this, at the end of the day, when you make your reports at the end of the years, you want to make sure that they're accurate and they're accurate reflection of what actually happened in your business. His MasterCard, I don't want to go too deep. I, don't, I know we're kind of getting pressed for time. I want to move a little bit further, but right here, he's going to categorize these expenses. So say this $150 for Lara's lamination, this may be supplies. It's an expense, but it's a supplies expense. I want to categorize it as such and add it. And once I take it from the bank feed and add it from the bank feed, it goes now to our next step where we're going to talk about in recording. So we're going to talk about those financial statements that we're going to use for, to report it. But this accounting step is this is where you're going to actually categorize everything. All right, so do we have any questions on that particular portion? If you could go back to that expense real quick that you just did uh, before. Uh, the, oh, that I just categorized? What you just did, where you put it, you, you put it to as excess expense. And I saw yep. there that it said something about project. I think that's where, it supplies, the supplies. Where you have the supplies okay, there. Right here. Yep. Uh, customer project. So if you had already created a customer project, you can, you know, uh, link that to that particular so customer. Sure. So this relates to Frank's question. So when he has projects and he has an expense that comes out that relates to that specific customer or that specific project, and you have the plus subscription level of QuickBooks online, you can designate it for whatever project that it relates to. So you can tell it where to go if it relates and to that can, specific. And I can see there is, is there billable or not billable. So if it's billable, sure. when you create an invoice, it will show up that you're charging the customer for that expense. You can do, like I said, you can, these uh, accounting softwares can be as robust and as detailed as you need them to be. So yeah, if that's part of your business model and you need to bill your clients certain expenses, QuickBooks offers that service as well. All right. And uh, I did put in the, in the chat a, a track, uh, a link to a QuickBooks um, help um, page on tracking job costs on QuickBooks desktop. So that it shows you st step by step how to do that on QuickBooks desktop. I put on the chat. Um, awesome. awesome. Yeah, they 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 have a way of doing it. It's, it's different, but you know, there's there's a guide there, step by step. Um, a few more questions here. So, if you do a subscription program, say for QuickBooks, you know, the basic, can you switch to the higher um, uh, version of QuickBooks without losing data? Is everything in the cloud with a company? required to stay? Well, sorry, that was the first question. So, so answer the first question. So that first question, if you have QuickBooks Online and you need to upgrade the service, so say you were at Simple Start and now you need to upgrade to Plus, you can do that seamlessly. At any time of the month, you can just change that um, subscription level and the data stays exactly the same. You won't lose anything at all. Right. Similarly, if you need to downgrade, you can do that without losing any data at all. Great. And uh, the same thing with desktop, you think, well, with desktop, it's in your computer, right? You have the save files in your computer. So if you're upgrading to another QuickBooks software, um, then you can technically just update your save files. Yeah, and, and I apologize. I'm not that well versed in the desktop version, but if you need to back up, I know there's a function where you can back up your desktop data, um, and you and I recommend you doing that frequently. And even if you want to convert from desktop to online, you can do that as well. 
Right, right. Um, and is everything in the cloud with the company, are you required to stay with the product, the company you started, that you couldn't go from QuickBooks to any of the other type of like Zero or, or the other type of software? So you have to kind of stay with that, you know, if you started there, unless you're starting a whole new account with the other folks. I mean, I, if you're changing, I recommend you do it um, maybe like at the end of the year or something, right. just so that you have a full year's data with one accounting software and then before you switch to another. But you can always download all your data and upload it on another cloud-based platform. That's no problem at all. But just for your own sanity, I recommend kind of you staying with something until there is like a cutoff point, which usually is the year end. Right, the year end. Um, and how do you, since you're already in QuickBooks here, do you categorize a loan payment? How would you categorize a loan payment as an expense here on the QuickBooks? Yeah, so say if this $8.99 came in, oh, a loan payment now? Yeah, yeah, so you took a loan to buy a piece of equipment or maybe, you know, it's a new building or something, you, you got to pay, you know, your loan payment um, on that. How would you categorize it? Yeah. All right. So this um, may get a little in the weeds, but say if you took out a loan and you're paying down that loan, um, and of course with any loan payment, a portion of that goes to principal and a portion of that goes to interest. Mm -hmm. So in a software like QuickBooks, you want to actually, it offers that functionality to split. So say if this is a loan payment, I would have to split it between, um, say if I find, does he have a loan on the books? Let's see. Uh, say if he has a note payable on the, a loan payable on the books and say of that 150, a hundred of it is principal. So I would put a hundred dollars there and then $50 of that is interest. I would split that and find interest expense if it's in there. Uh, right. It's interesting. It's I, I, interesting. I see I see what you're doing. So you're separating the amount paid for the principal of the loan and the interest into two two entries but related to that loan payment for that month. One entry but it's split. Oh one entry and but it's split, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the total amount is 150, but I'm segregating one hundred of it as principal and fifty dollars of it as interest. Right. Okay. So that's how you would do it on, you know, once a month when you're making that payment. Okay. Yep. You would have to split it between um, and, principal and, and so for some folks who are going to try this, they're going to connect it to their bank account. Right. And so in the bank account, that negative 150 will show up that they made a check or a payment, electronic payment to whomever uh, for a loan. And so when they get that, that's what every month they need to go back and reconcile it right like go back and categorize all of those transactions right and and yeah. does it learn to to do that automatically after a while or or you have to do it every time manually well, QuickBooks gets smart. So the more that you categorize um, um, transactions, the more it will predict it. So say if you had 150 every month, it would start to categorize it as loan payable. But again, that principal and interest version may change every month. So you want your loan statement in front of you at the end of the, or whenever you're making that payment or whatever you're doing your accounting, you want that loan statement in front of you. And on that loan statement, it'll tell you how much is principal and how much is interest. So you need that in hand when you wanna um, record this transaction if you wanna do it accurately. Okay. And can you have um, two different businesses running out of the same QuickBooks account? Or you have to get another QuickBooks account for another business. So you can, but it has to be with the plus level of service, the plus subscription level. And you would use um, what is called, uh, what do they call it? Classes, account classes, I think they call it. Um, let me see if I go back in here. Um, it's called... See, see, so QuickBooks tries to get smart. So every time you do something, it'll say, do you want to create a rule to, that every time you pay Lara's Lemonation, it's for this? So you can create a rule. That's beyond the scope. Um, right, right. Okay. So, so yeah, in general, so you like you, one QuickBooks account. Sorry. 
So yeah, so I was answering the question. So if you have the plus uh, level of, of QuickBooks online, you can create separate classes for diff the different businesses and separate out, separate the income and expense for each. And just to, to reiterate or clarify, because someone asked the question, what you mean by switching like from QuickBooks to Wave or to Zero or any of that, you know, uh, your data, your transactional data, your past history data, it may not be able to come with you because they, those systems are not necessarily compatible necessarily, but, um, but just keep in mind, do it at the end of the year, like once you close your books, like close your books with QuickBooks or whatever you're using, and you want to start using a new software so that you start fresh with that new software, um, and you can bring over all your ending balances, I guess, if you will, you know, or your beginning balance, you start kind of like new. You don't, you're yeah. not bringing your history. You lose that history with that software, but you still have it in your other account, which you kind of close out before you start the new one. I would say that's correct. Yeah. And how do you define a year year? I mean, some people go by, um, you know, the 12 months of the year, you know, December or, or it's, um, is uh, fiscal years, you know, when would you do, when do you do each one of those? In which situation? So your, so your default, if you're a sole proprietor, you haven't incorporated or anything like that, your default is calendar year. So that means December 31st is the end of your year. And that corresponds with your personal income tax return. But whenever you incorporate, you have the option to choose a fiscal year in. And that makes the most sense for maybe nonprofits. They maybe want a June 30 fiscal year in. Or I remember when I was auditing grocery stores, they would have a January 31st fiscal year in. Though you make those choices when you incorp formally incorporate. And that would be where you, whether you choose to be a calendar year in, which is the default, or designate a fiscal year and to end on a specific month of the year. All right. Great. Thank you. Cool. All right. All right. Let's go back to, I know we only have a few minutes. This last section, we'll just try to try to just get through it uh, as quickly as possible. Um, let's see. Are we, do you see the uh, financial, prepare financial statement slide? We see it. We see the slide, yes. Cool beans. All right. So we talked about gathering financial records or financial data. That's the first step. The second step was recording financial transactions. That's the meat of it. That's where you do the actual accounting. This last step, we'll make it quick and easy in case we want questions at the end, is you prepare financial statements. So after you have recorded all your transactions, you told QuickBooks what it was, you told your Excel, per, whatever you're using, you um, told it what it is, each transaction, you have the paper to back it up or you have the document to back up all the income and all the expense. Now you're gonna prepare your financial statements. And this is often taught, called uh, oftentimes called post accounting or financial reporting. And that's defined as uh, the financial results of an organization that you didn't release to um, maybe to your creditors. They may want to see your financial statements or you may want to even, I, this is the part I love, you use your financial statements for yourself to even just assess the health of your business or make business decisions going forward. I'm going to try to move a little bit fast. So your financial, store, store, uh, financial statements tell you the story of your business or organization, the numbers, they tell it all. Um, so you can evaluate the health of the company by reviewing and reconciling these reports on a regular basis, whether it's at the end of the year, whether it's monthly, quarterly, you should take a look at those financial statements to see how your business is doing. Those Ooh. financial statements, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but those financial statements, or well, let's talk about a little bit more about the uh, usefulness. Those financial statements are used by yourself or by investors or by the loan officers or your advisors and others to review your performance, make business decisions, maybe assess the comp maybe you um, um uh, decided to launch a new product line and you want to see how profitable that product line is use your financial statements analyze your financial statements to see how much income or revenue came in and the expenses that are related to offering that new product line and assess how profitable that is that's a, a useful a useful way to use your financial statements 
they're also used for credit worthiness. So this was a big thing when I was helping small business owners apply for those SBA COVID related funds uh, that we needed to generate financial statements. And some of the businesses did not have those financial statements in place and we had to go back and reconstruct it. But these quick, so it's important not only to prepare your taxes because you do need your financial statements to prepare your taxes, but it's good to have those, prepare those on a regular basis. So if you ever Ever need a loan. Um, so maybe, I mean, like most businesses, they've their revenue has dipped 50% or more in these past six months. And so now they maybe need a little gap loan to get them through. You need the financial statements. You go to your bank and say, this is the profitability of my business in past. We may be having some issues right now, but this is how the performance has been. Can we get a loan? Okay, the balance sheet shows the assets um, and the liabilities, the assets are what the company owns. The liabilities, as we talked about, is what the company owes. The equity is the difference between the two. I apologize if I'm moving a little quickly, but this is Craig's design and landscaping balance sheet. You see his assets are lined up there. His accounts, his bank accounts, his accounts receivable. He sold some things on credit and he has $5,000 coming in. Remember, this is as of a particular point in time. So as of the end of August, he had $5,000 that he expected to come in. That's his accounts receivable. He also had some inventory. He also had some trucks, a truck that he purchased. That's an asset. On the liability side, I apologize if you can't see this clearly. Hopefully you'll get the slides and you'll be able to see it a little more clearly. But the liability side, uh, he has accounts payable. He has those credit cards. And he also has um, taxes payable. That's a liability. He took out some loans, took out a $25,000 loan. That's a liability that's on the books. And this is the equity. This is the net income that has been retained in the business up until that point and the retained earnings that has carried over for previous years. And this is my favorite part about accounting. Assets have to equal liabilities plus equity. One side has to equal the other, whether you're um, the small convenience store or whether you're a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar corporation. The accounting qu equation is still the same. Assets equals liabilities plus equity. Income statement, again, it's called profit and loss or P&L. That shows your revenue, that shows your expenses. And the difference between the two is the net income or the net loss. You should prepare those typically yearly, but quarterly or monthly, if that makes sense for you for analysis purposes. This is an example of his profit and loss, Craig's design and landscaping. As of 2020, as of the end of August, these are all his sources of revenue, his income. He had a small cost of goods sold. And now here's those other expenses that we talked about earlier, advertising, automobile, rental, insurance, job materials. These are all those expenses that relates to his business, legal and professional, maybe he paid an accountant, maybe he pay, paid a lawyer. Those are expenses that are deductible, office expenses, maybe he bought some supplies, some paper, utilities. These are all part of his profit and loss. And at the end of the day, you, uh, it'd be, you know, ideal if this number was a positive, but at the end of August 31st, he had a loss of $2,916. So his total income uh, was 10002 And by the time he was deducting all of these total expenses, um, he got down to a loss of almost $3,000. All right, so that was quick and dirty. Um, if you have any questions, we can take that for the next uh, few moments. Sure, um, hold on, here we go. I was just answering a question here in the Q&A about how often QuickBooks updates your bank account information and I found it in, um, I found this uh, QuickBooks um, help uh, desk really, really helpful. Um, and uh, it looks like they do it nightly or two, time, two or three times per week, depending on the banking institution. Once you link your account, QuickBooks will update your account information. Uh, and you can synchronize that anytime. So if you want to go in there and synchronize it. You can do it manually, it now, right? Manually. You manually. Can, yeah, synchronize it. Okay, so do you have, we have a few questions here. So do, um, 
so there's a question here. Uh, do expired cost of goods sold count towards losses? For instance, Ex herbs, so here's an example. Herbs used to make an herbal preparation that expired, you know, through the moss or loss in quality, for instance. Do those count towards losses? I think that's like obsolescence, like you have inventory that goes bad. So that is, that is, a, that is an expense or a loss that you can take on your tax return. Okay, okay. Does that ask in your, ask, sir, um, answer your question, Alexandra? I sent her a quick request to unmute. Okay, sure, yes. Okay, so, yes, yes, she said yes, yes, okay. good. we're good. Excellent. So, um, you know, another question that we get um, a lot, Katisha, some folks are starting online businesses right now because that's, that's what's in, right? Everybody's home. Uh, you're trying to figure out ways of getting your product out there. So whether you have a brick and mortar and you're starting a new uh, website for your brick and mortar or you're starting a completely new online business. My question to you is, um, you know, how, how would you be able to, um, is there a way with QuickBooks to track, you know, your taxes, um, uh, sales tax, you know, for the product, as you collect like sex sales tax from the sales online? Yeah, so um, your so your point of sale service that you may be using, they um, they should be able to track it for you. But if you use QuickBooks to sell your products, QuickBooks does offer the ability to track sales tax, and they do offer the ability to connect with your state and actually directly pay the sales tax from directly from QuickBooks. So yeah, they do offer that functionality. Excellent. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, I was doing quite a bit of research on that on the, what do they call it? The, the tax nexus, if you have nexus in yeah. a particular state or not, and it's based on, you know, physical, you know, like if you have a physical presence in that state, or if you have fulfillment facilities, like if you're selling stuff fulfilled by Amazon, for example, you might have a nexus in those states, but I guess, like you said, use the point the of sale system. Go ahead. Yeah, the law has changed quite a bit. So definitely um, check in with your accountant and, and do a little research because um, for those online businesses, you may be required, even though you don't have a presence there, you may be required to withhold um, and collect sales tax. Correct. All right. Great. Thank you so much for that. So um, again, I want to go ahead and thank everybody to uh, uh, that attended today's webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Katisha, for being with us today. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank all of the organizations who made this webinar possible. Um, we will make sure to send you all a copy of um, of today's slides um, with Katisha's permission. I think you're okay with that, right, Katisha? Of course. Excellent. And uh, I want to thank um, uh, all of the organizations who made these uh, webinars possible. I'm flashing their names on the screen. These are business advisors here in the region who are available to assist you with all of your uh, general business questions. If you're starting a business, growing a business, as well as the MSBDC, which is the organization that I represent, the Small Business Development Center. Our website is on the screen and there's offices all throughout the state. So and uh, thank you so much again, Katisha, for being with us today. Um, I look forward to meeting with you again. Maybe we'll do something like this again in the future and, and try the other software that you showed. Sure, absolutely. And thank you so much again, Samala, for the invitation. Thank you all business owners, wishing you much success in your business endeavors. Hopefully we'll talk again sometime. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, y'all.